Okay, um, this is Commander Arthur Blaine. I am at OHSU San Diego, cross assigned to EMF Pendleton, and this is a uh, talk on patient safety. So the objectives of this talk are several things. Uh, to understand simple strategies to reduce medication errors, to describe risk factors and evaluation of suicide patients, and to know components of an effective handoff, patient handoffs, and to describe the epidemiology and evaluation of drug overdoses. So the genesis of this lecture happened from my job uh, in my civilian life, I am the chief medical executive of California State Prison in Los Angeles County. It's a men's prison, and we have uh, 3,500 uh, male patients, and some of them are very complicated. Uh, we have a large number of psychiatric issues going on. We have a large number of overdoses and drug abuse type of uh, uh, situations, and... Um, We've done uh, improvement projects to reduce medication errors and to uh, make sure handoffs, uh, effective patient handoffs are, are improved. These all are aspects of improving patient safety. So reducing medication errors. The topics I'm going to briefly mention, which are present in a uh, a longer lecture on just this topic uh, that I also do include simple strategies to avoid medication errors including patient information and drug information and I'm going to talk a little bit about error prone abbreviations so simple strategies to avoid medication errors patient information this is key to uh, reducing uh, medication errors so uh, many of these things we all do if we have an electronic medical record. Uh, sometimes, especially if we're uh, at a small clinic or overseas with the Navy or in certain settings, uh, things are on paper or things are not quite as organized and you have to be vigilant about organizing these, uh, these aspects of reducing medication errors. So patient specific identifiers, there has to always be at least two ways to identify a patient. So for example, name and date of birth. Uh, name alert stickers are one way to do that. Verifying allergies and reactions. Um, we talk about this, we all uh, say we do this, but sometimes we don't. Uh, what I like to see all my medical students and residents and uh, doctors do is every single time they write a medication, 100% of the time we write any medication or give any medication to somebody, ask them what their allergies are. Don't look at the chart and see NKDA and assume they have no allergies. Um, I've caught many, many cases where nothing's on the chart. Uh, the electronic medical record says NKDA and the patient says, oh yeah, I'm, I, I'm allergic to penicillin and, um, and then they give me a description of anaphylaxis five years ago. Um, so it's, it's really important to just, just ask the question again. It takes all of two and a half seconds to ask them if they're allergic to something before you write for an, a new medication. Highlight critical diagnoses. Um, this is important. Um, I don't think my current electronic medical record has this but I have used electronic medical records in the past that have a big red optional uh, sticky on the top or, or screen on the top where you can type anything you want you can t uh, for, and critical diagnoses so somebody who has severe uh, coronary artery disease or is female of childbearing age for example uh, which might pose certain obvious medication restrictions to them um, and uh, you know also document smoking alcohol and drugs you probably don't want to be given opioids to somebody who has a documented history of drug abuse for example 
update their current medication. So medication reconciliation is very important. Every single patient encounter, every single visit uh, should have some sort of medication reconciliation and uh, double check of side effects, for example, of medications or interactions of medications. Ideally, uh, you have a pharmacist work with you and help you to do this. These medications that you're looking at for side effects and interactions should include over-the-counter medications, herbals, supplements, vitamins. Another thing to do that's very important is standardize height and weight measurements. Your clinic can choose to uh, use pounds and inches or kilograms and, or, and centimeters, for example, but have the exact same uh, standard of measurement. The standard of care these days, I think, is metric, obviously. Um, but some clinics choose to do the opposite, uh, which is fine as long as uh, everybody knows what, what, the, what is being used in your organization. So drug information, maintain uh, drug references. So ha have access. If you have an electronic medical record, it probably has a button on there for Hippocrates or uh, drug facts and comparisons is another software, uh, but some way to have access to this. There's free uh, um, access to this also. I use monthly prescribing reference all the time uh, for side effects. I've done that for years and I just go uh, Google it whenever I need it. And it also has a button for patient handouts, so I, I give the appropriate patients a handout on their medication. <laughs> Establish guidelines for practice. So. Um, outline correct dosages, contraindications, precautions. Again, it's it's better to have a pharmacist help you with this, but we, we can do this in a primary care setting also. Identify high alert medications. So warfarin, low molecular weight heparin, insulin, diabetic medications, opiates, methotrexate. The list is much longer, obviously, but these are things to look at. Beware of beers list. Beers list is a list of 48 medications or classes to avoid in patients over 65 years of age. So for example, Prozac has a long half-life and can lead to agitation and should be avoided in the elderly. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories should be avoided if possible uh, in the elderly or used at low doses. They can lead to GI bleeds, renal failure, hypertension, heart failure. They exacerbate all these uh, medical issues. Muscle relaxants lead to ambulatory dysfunction or ataxia or falls. Benzodiazepine, same thing, can lead to confusion, can lead to falls, and should be avoided in the uh, elderly. So some other issues. Communication share information. Consider each member of your medical team as equal. It does not matter whether it's a doctor, a nurse, an LVN, um, the, the, somebody at the front desk, anybody. All Everybody has a valuable piece of information and health care that they provide to the patient. Uh, improve handwriting. Um, that's my uh, crux uh, is my handwriting and thank God I'm really good at electronic medical records but back when in the day of paper charts uh, that used to be something that uh, had a was a problem for me uh, avoid problematic abbreviations and I'm, I have a, the next slide talks about that briefly watch out for similar drug names Isardil, Plendil for example, Celebrex, Cerebix, uh, Lamictal and Lamisil for example Zyprexa, Zyrtec, Zantac. These things all sound similar and they're very, very different medications. Include the indication for the medications. That That is sometimes very helpful. So hopefully uh, your electronic medical record, you write the medication and you write for depression. Or you, you know, most electronic medical records these days force you to put the diagnosis for which you're writing the medication. <laughs> Use computerized order entry or electronic medical records. So most of us are doing that these days. Um, that all by itself leads to decrease in medication errors. Provide the initial medication to the patient uh, in-house if you're dispensing. That way you, uh, you know that the patient's getting 
the correct medication and you probably have a pharmacist who's working with you to help you do that also. Labeling and storage is another uh, very important area for, that leads to medication errors if, you, if we're not careful. So separate problematic drugs should not be stored close to each other. They should be in different areas. Keep storage areas organized. Uh, get rid of the clutter. Uh, we have a problem with, with this in my current uh, work setting and it just needs to be organized better. Control medication access. Only people who should be having access to medication should be able to have a key or a combination to that area. For vaccines, uh, use vaccine logs including lot numbers, expiration, patient name, dose, date given. For multi-dose injectable medications, write down the label, it, uh, label the date that it was opened and discarded and it's usually 30 days after it's opened that you discard it. Drug devices. Uh, in pediatrics, for example, do not use IV syringes for oral medication. Train the staff and patients not to do this and not to teach parents to do this. Patient education should be both oral and written. Different people retain information, whether it's medical or not, in different ways. So some people are better with something written, some people are better with oral. Uh, and uh, so pa this gets into the uh, separate topic of patient medical literacy. Be careful of patients' um, education levels or their language or their culture. These can all impact whether they're understanding what you're giving them uh, as far as medication goes. Be careful about ability to pay. Um, I ran into this a lot in the community clinic setting um, where I can write for whatever I want and if the patient can't afford it, they're not going to take it. So it doesn't help if I write it uh, or at least I need to figure out a way to get them the medication in an affordable manner. So error prone abbreviations. Be careful of, for example, U. We write U for unit and it can be mistaken for a, uh, uh, a zero. Uh, number four or CC so the, the solution on that is just write the word unit out and that's the solution for mo most of these things just avoid abbrevi abbreviations write the words out and then there's no mistake so IU international unit it can be mistaken for IV or the number 10 so write the words international unit out QD for daily it can be mistaken for QID so again write the word daily out QOD every other day it can be mistaken for QID and QD, for example. Write the words every other day. Trailing zeros. These next two, I've seen lawsuits, gigantic lawsuits in uh, in the pediatric setting oftentimes. So be very careful of, of these decimal points. So trailing zeros, X.0 milligrams. The decimal point can be missed. Instead of writing 1.0 milligrams, people might think it's 10 milligrams instead and give 10 milligrams to the child for example write X milligrams so just write the word 1 milligram instead of uh, 1.0 milligrams for example uh, leading zero so point X milligrams the decimal point can be easily be missed so instead of that write 0 0.1 milligrams instead of uh, only 0.1 milligrams because then somebody could get 1 milligram instead of 0.1 milligrams for example so the next topic, um, and you can see I'm spending just a, a brief amount of time on these. Uh, these were very high, uh, high value topics uh, in, in my work setting anyway. And they, they're also high value topics in many other clinic settings. So briefly, uh, suicide. Approximately 37,000 people die uh, excuse me, let me rephrase that. Approximately 37,000 people in the, in the United States and 1 million people worldwide die by suicide each year. 650,000 people in the United States receive emergency treatment each year after attempting suicide. One statistic that I need to type on this slide, which is just absolutely astounding to me, is if you pull the statistics, the number 10 cause of death in the United States, and it might fluctuate a tiny bit year by year, but usually the number 10 cause of death in the United States is suicide. Um, I just, I, I find that statistic mind-boggling. Uh, um, and 
then that uh, begs into question, you know, how we detect this and how we treat it, obviously. So suicide risk factors. For most complicated diagnoses, so heart disease, stroke, uh, various things that we do to analyze patients, you, it's not obvious if you just look at a patient that they have something. So we, we start thinking about risk factors. So history of previous suicide attempts or threats, psychiatric diagnoses, hopelessness and impulsivity, marital status, uh, never married, uh, that has a greater suicide risk than widowed, which is greater than separated, which is greater than divorced, which is greater than married without children. So just things to think about. Um, adverse childhood experiences. Family history and genetics. Um, that's important for suicide as well as many other diagnoses. Age, sex, and race. So increased age. The older you are, the more chance of having this as a problem. Females have more attempts at suicide, young, and young adults have more attempts. Males have more completed suicides. Elderly white men over than, older than 85 years old have the highest rate of suicides. Occupation unskilled, um, and for occupation you can throw male physicians in there. We, uh, we are a high risk category. Military service, um, if you're, if we're, we're in the military, we have a higher incidence of suicide than people not in the military. Health issues, chronic pain issues, firearms, having a gun in the house is associated with a higher risk of suicide. Antidepressants, uh, protective effects, uh, or social and family connectedness. So. This slide is specific for my workplace, but uh, the demographics of uh, where I work are, are interesting, and I think they're similar to uh, other populations. But 87% um, were under the age of 40 where, where I work. The average age was 34, and I know this is not uh, the same as uh, uh, some communities. The uh, so it's a younger age demographic uh, in, in my particular work setting. Suicide patient evaluation. So review the risk factors and protective factors. Focus on identifying modifiable targets for intervention. So what's really important for as, uh, suicide assessment is simply ask the patient point blank, are you having thoughts about hurting yourself or someone else? Ask the question. One thing that helps for this is having depression questionnaires be a systemic part of treating patients in your healthcare institution. So have 100% of patients, for example, have a PHQ-2. This is actually required in community clinics or FQHCs, federally qualified healthcare centers. And so these questions would be, over the last two weeks, have you had thoughts that you would be better off dead? or of hurting yourself in some way. So that's part of a PHQ-2. Assess for active versus passive suicidal ideation. At my work setting, at uh, so California State Prison, Los Angeles County, we can call a crisis line, which is extension 7098. We all know the on-call psychiatry number. And for the Navy or all military, there is a military crisis line. Suicidal patients, the thing, call an emergency referral. You can always get an on-call psychiatry team. When I worked in the community clinic setting, uh, almost all counties have a crisis referral team, and it usually involves the police department, and they will be at your door in five minutes. If you call this line, uh, you need to have stickers on all the phones or have it extremely available to everybody. If you call that phone number, the police and this uh, crisis team would, mo would most likely be at your clinic within five minutes uh, in most settings. So um, make sure the patient is not left unobserved second you're starting to think about suicide it's 100 percent observation by somebody so a nurse a doctor a security guard somebody has to help you okay so switching to 
patient handoffs. This is a, an area of patient safety that's extremely important. So the handoff process is a fluid dynamic exchange that is, this, that is subject to distraction, interruptions, and it fluctuates in aptitude and confidence of uh, offgoing and oncoming clinicians. And when I use the word clinician, I'm talking about nurses, doctors, PAs, nurse practitioners, it can be LVNs, it can be medical assistants, it can be anybody that relays health important healthcare information to the next person coming on their shift or to work. So we have a 24 hour shift where we are, which is three shifts. So all these people have to pass off medical important medical information. So the four steps of effective patient handoffs. <laughs> Pre-handoffs, so the sender organizes and updates information in preparation for the handoff. Arrival, work is stopped in order to conduct the handoff. Ideally, time is protected for the handoff to occur. This really doesn't take more than five or ten minutes. In our uh, in our work setting, we do huddles in the morning. I think most clinics are doing huddles. We did that in the community clinic setting also. The that is where the daily, you can call that a patient handoff because anything that occurred over the previous shift or previous 24 hours that was important is discussed in that huddle. So that is a form of a handoff. The third thing is dialogue. An exchange takes place between the sender and the receiver. Ideally this is verbal but it can be written and electronic as well and I personally think it should be it should be all three. You should be able to look it up, you should have a piece of paper in your hand and you should be having a conversation with somebody. Post handoff, the receiver of the patient information integrates the new information and assumes care of the patient. So components to an effective handoff are verbal communication, written communication, and transfer of professional responsibility. This gets into a little bit of medical legal aspects of medicine. If you watched a patient for the last eight or 10 or 12 hours or a, a group of patients, during that time period, it was your professional responsibility to take care of those patients. And when you do a patient handoff, you're actually transferring professional responsibility to the new person coming on. So it's a medical legal issue in addition to a quality of care patient issue. Um, the next thing is uh, strategies for effective handoffs. These are just things that um, are important to uh, have better patient handoffs and improve quality of care. There's different ways to do this. Um, we do in the um, hospice setting, for example, we do SBAR situation background assessment recommendation that's just one mnemonic or one brief way to pass off patients to somebody i pass i've seen this in different settings I've, I've actually seen that in the military also it's talks that acronym stands for illness severity patient summary action list situational awareness and contingent contingency planning and synthesis by the receiver so face-to-face uh, -face verbal communication and interactive questioning. So it's really important to stop what you're doing and look somebody in the eye and have a conversation. Um, written templates for handoffs. We used to use these in residency all the time where uh, we had to fill out information uh, and update it during that shift and hand it to the new person coming on taking care of uh, the particular patient. So some other important issues, optimizing the setting. Don't do handoffs in a noisy area. Um, go back to a room uh, where there's not too many people or you can close the door and nobody comes in. Put a sign on the door saying, give me five minutes, don't come in for five minutes or um, so that you can have an optimal setting for passing this information off that's quiet and you and both of you can focus. Optimizing the schedule and team structure. So there's just having organization to this handoff setting, maximizing team continuity, having the same people do these handoffs every time instead of having different people uh, as much as possible. Schedule should be arranged so that double handoffs are avoided. So for example, 
you come in and you pass it off to one person and then 30 minutes later the next person comes in and you pass it off again uh, we've all seen the musical chairs where you whisper something into uh, one person's ear and they keep whispering it around in a circle to five or ten people by the time it gets back to you it's a completely different story so this is the same type of situation all quality of care issues should involve the minimal number of people possible customized handoffs for the highest risk patients so the highest risk patients probably deserve a little bit different customized manner of doing the handoff that you focus on uh, important information Focus the verbal handoff on the most important items. So d don't talk for 15, 20 minutes. People aren't going to listen. Talk for a brief period of time and mention the most important information. Emphasize tasks to be done and give specific anticipatory guidance. So um, I try to do this in all my progress notes that I type, and handoffs are just as important. Tell the next person what they should be doing. Get if there's an x-ray that you need to follow up on, that you, that you ordered an x-ray and you know it's going to be back in a couple hours, make sure they check it. Um, check for receiver understanding. Ask the person to repeat what you said, for example. U use of readback. Active listening. Uh, make sure you got eye contact for the person who's uh, listening to you. Uh, drug poisoning uh, is the next topic. And uh, we have a big issue with this in my work setting, but I've seen it in, in every single work setting I've ever been in. As of 2008, poisoning has become the leading cause of injury-related injury death in the United States, surpassing motor vehicles. Majority of poisoning fatalities were related to drugs. There were 36,500 cases in 2008. Most overdoses involve prescription drugs, and in parentheses on that, you can write down providers, physicians, PAs, and nurse practitioners. We did it. If you wrote the prescription, you're at least partially involved in the fault of these issues. Patients aged 35 to 54 years old accounted for the highest number of poisonings. A lot of these are opioids. But patients between 18 and 20 had the highest rate of drug abuse. And sometimes this includes things like getting these drugs out of their parents' cabinets, uh, for example, or uh, illicitly buying these. Most common exposures were due to analgesics, which is 11.3% of these, sedatives and antipsychotics, 5.9%, and antidepressants, 4.4%. Drug poisoning. So how do you work these people up? Just like most things we do, do a complete history and physical exam. Management is supportive focus on the ABCs or these days uh, circulation is the top of the list as far as BLS goes but prevention of poison absorption use of antidotes enhanced elimination techniques and I'm not going to go over specifically all the different types of poisonings and how you manage them but um, probably the, one of the most important things to do if you get a drug poisoning is call the drug poisoning 800 phone number and they'll walk you through it. They, they do this all the time so that should be a number that you have readily available to you. Stabilize and prevent deterioration deter oh boy. Stabilize and prevent deterioration of the patient. So vital signs, mental status, pupil size, skin temperature and moisture, pulse oximetry, continuous cardiac monitoring, EKG. All these things are important as far as assessing the patient and maybe telling you what they took. IV access, get a finger stick glucose. If somebody is on the ground and you don't know why they got there, don't assume it's a drug overdose. Assume it's some sort of trauma and you need to do C-spine stabilization. So CPR, protect the airways, avoid aspiration. So drug, here's some examples of things that we would do um, and most of these are safe for 100% of patients. So if in my work, if I see a patient down or if any of us see a patient down, we give them naloxone. We always give them naloxone. We, and if, if it's not responsive to that, uh, then we didn't hurt them. It didn't do anything. Thiamine is important to give. Um, that is related to alcohol poisoning. 
uh, 25 grams of dextrose. If somebody's on the ground and acting like they are have a drug overdose, it might be hyperglycemia or DKA or some sort of, uh, or maybe just the opposite, an insulin overdose. So it, you know, we can't always assume drug poisoning. Don't forget, expose the patient completely. So if somebody's on the ground, either there or in the urgent care center, take a scissor and cut all their clothes off because there might be trauma somewhere else or swelling in their extremities, for example. United States Poison Control Center number is toll free. It's 800-222-1222. And transfer that patient to the ER. Most of us don't work in an ER setting where we see this. Uh, get that patient to the emergency room as quickly as possible. So common medical issues or emergencies. I threw these last two cases on here as far as patient safety because they were directly related to quality of care issues in, in my work setting. And they're really important issues um, for patient care inside and outside of the military and inside and outside of my work setting. And I, I have a much uh, larger lecture on several more issues on common urgent medical issues. But I'm going to go over abdominal pain and chest pain uh, quickly. So abdominal pain, epidemiology, it's very common. It's most of the time it's benign, most of the time it's self-limited. But what I tell all medical students and residents and nurses and uh, mid-level providers, especially when they're first learning uh, how to be a good clinician, is assume the worst thing first and then work yourself backwards. So if you see somebody with abdominal pain, assume it's the worst possible diagnosis, assume they perforated their appendix, prove it's not that, and work your way backwards to a stomach virus or you know, acid reflux or something that's not as uh, dangerous. So um, I put a picture of uh, Cope's early diagnosis of the acute abdomen. This is a very, very old book. It's very small. You can read it in less than a day. And it's the um, one of the first things that uh, anybody in medical school or any any learning setting for diagnosing patients uh, reads as far as the acute abdomen. All surgeons are told to read this on the, the first week of their surgery residency, for example. So, for example, uh, we start off with history, uh, with, with everything we're doing. So identify serious etiologies or causes. Look at your differential diagnosis. Think of a differential diagnosis. This will lead you to lab and or imaging studies. Determine if it's acute versus chronic pain. Determine if it's accelerating versus intermittent. Uh, do your PQRSTs. That, that, for all pain issues, PQ, PQRST. So determine their, uh, where the pain is located, the quality of the pain, whether it's radiating, alleviating factors, uh, worsening factors, and the temporal aspect of it. So location, left upper quadrant, epigastric, right upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, suprapubic. All these different locations are going to take your history and your exam and your assessment and your diagnosis and treatment in different directions. Temporal, so look at the onset, the frequency, the duration of the abdominal pain. Quality, burning, gnawing, colicky. Um, again, these lead you into different areas of assessment and differential diagnosis. Severity, 0 to 10 pain scales. Be careful of people on steroids. It masks pain. Be careful of people who have diabetes. Their nerves are damaged and they might not feel pain as well. Be careful of female patients, uh, especially with chest pain, because they have atypical chest pain symptoms that don't look textbook. And it could be something bad and you need to be careful. Associated symptoms, so nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, hematochesia, melanoma, so blood, coughing up blood, having blood in the stool, black stools, change in the stool caliber are all important. Jaundice, pain on urination, blood in the urine, fevers, chills, weight loss, uh, fatigue, anorexia, or you know, decreased appetite, cough, shortness of breath, dyspnea on exertion, orthostatic hypotension. 
polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, that's diabetes. So increased urine, urination, increased thirst, increased hunger. Uh, women, be careful of STDs and pelvic inflammatory disease, for example. I've mm -hmm. seen several cases over the years where somebody pokes on a female's abdomen and goes, hmm, that's probably her appendix. And uh, so that gets into a physical exam issue. 100% of female patients get an HCG and they get a pelvic exam and you're looking for pelvic inflammatory disease. You're looking for cervical motion tenderness. 100% of male and female patients with abdominal pain get a rectal exam. You have to do a rectal exam. You're looking for bleeding. You're looking for uh, abnormalities in that area. Um, so ask about number of sex partners, pain on sexual intercourse, last menstrual period, uh, vaginal discharge or bleeding, past medical history, ask about past histories of surgeries, history of coronary artery disease, looking for ischemia, look at their medications, medications that might cause constipation, look at non anti-inflammatories for example, antibiotics, be careful of somebody who just took 10 days or 14 days or 21 days of antibiotics for something because they could have Clostridia difficile which is a very contagious form of diarrhea that requires treatment with uh, usually vancomycin or other medications to get rid of it. Alcohol, be careful of liver, liver disease and pancreatitis in those patients. Family history, look for inflammatory bowel disease or cancer issues, colon cancer for example. Travel, uh, travelers, uh, gastroenteritis for example, colitis, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Look for sick contacts, uh, church picnics, anybody else was sick around you, uh, infectious versus foodborne illnesses. So physical exam, again, 100% of patients get a rectal exam. Vital signs, get an O2 sat, uh, temperature. If their heart rate is high or they look dry, get orthostatics. And orthostatics, by the way, is heart rate and blood pressure laying, sitting, and standing with three minutes in between, usually. So distracted physical exam, so in other words, when you do your physical exam, poke on the area that's not hurting first. Uh, that's one way to figure out where they're having the pain. Inspection, t uh, see if the patient looks toxic. Uh, see what their position of comfort is. Uh, immobility, take your knee and bump their bed and see if they have peritoneal signs, for example. Auscultation, bowel sounds, ileus, uh, high-pitched bowel sounds, for example. Uh, percussion, peritonitis, ascites, end-stage liver disease, shifting dullness, for example, palpation, feel masses, feel for masses, feel for hepatosplenomegaly, guarding rebound, look for dermatomal patterns such as herpes zoster, rectal exam, feel for impaction, tenderness, retrocecal abscess, for example, pelvic exam, pelvic inflammatory disease, look at their eyes, see if they're jaundiced, icterus, pulmonary and cardiac exams. So differential diagnosis of abdominal pain is huge. Uh, common uh, diagnoses include, our, you can segregate these by where the pain is located. So left upper quadrant, splenomegaly, splenic infarct, splenic abscess, splenic rupture, Epigastric, acute myocardial infarction. Be very careful of people, quote unquote, not having chest pain and having epigastric pain. It could be a heart attack, so be careful on that. Acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, peptic ulcer disease, gastroesophageal reflux disease, gastritis, functional dyspepsia, gastroparesis. Right upper quadrant pain. Your liver's up there, your gallbladder's there. So biliary, biliary colic, acute cholecystitis, acute cholangitis, sphincter of OD dysfunction. Hepatic, acute hepatitis, perihepatitis. Think about Fitzhugh Hurtis syndrome. That's the perihepatitis. The capsule of the liver has pain fibers that hurt if the liver gets swollen. Liver abscess, Bud Chiari, portal vein thrombosis. So, treatment plan, tests, patient preparation, treatment rehabilitation. So, tests depend on the location of the abdominal pain. Get occult stool cards when you do your rectal exam. 100% of female patients between 10 years old and 65 get a urine HCG. Uh, just assume they're pregnant and prove they're not. Uh, 
Get Labs, Chem 10, LFTs, Alkaline Phosphatase, Bilirubin, CBC with Differential, Urinalysis, Amylase Lipase. Get Labs for Diabetic Ketoacidosis. Get an uh, an appropriate imaging, so possibly ultrasound, CT, or MRI. Endoscopy. Think about an uh, upper endoscopy or lower endoscopy, EGD or colonoscopy. ERCP. Be careful in recommending ERCPs. I've seen several people die of those. Make sure you have the correct indication for that and make sure you have a gastroenterologist on board. Always get a chest x-ray. Look for pneumonia. That can cause abdominal pain uh, if it involves that uh, diaphragm area. Adrenal labs. Think about getting, uh, look for, if you have a low sodium, high potassium, get your adrenal labs. If it's anemia, get your iron labs, iron, TIBC, TIBC, ferritin. And the most important thing for assessing these patients is serial abdominal exams. Don't do your abdominal exam and say, eh, RTC, PRN, you know, come back whenever. Uh, see them back in 24 hours or maybe 12 hours but do your serial abdominal exams. I always tell people, uh, or my residents and medical students and anybody who works for me that I'm mentoring to, you can never leave an abnormal lab sitting on the chart and you can never leave an abnormal physical exam. You, it always has to be normal at some point and you need to follow these people until it is normal. Low threshold for ER admission, ICU admission. So. Last topic is chest pain. Epidemiology. So, two to four percent of the time it's an acute MI. And I guess you could flip that around and, and think, hmm, 96 to 98 percent of the time it's not a heart attack. <laughs> it's that one or two percent of the time that it is that will burn you. So, again, it goes back to the recommendation of 100 percent of the time assume it's the worst thing first, which is a heart attack, prove it's not, and then work your way back to muscle pain or something that's not, not uh, clinically as concerning. There is, um, I realized I put the uh, Spanish version of this book on there, but there's Dubin, uh, Rapid Interpretation of EKGs. It's a cartoon book, and it is the first book that all medical students need to read and and any i would argue anybody nurses pas nurse practitioners this is the first book you got to read if you ever plan on understanding ekgs it's really simple you can read it in less than a day and it's uh you will understand ekgs forever the first time you read it so one third to one half of the time uh chest pain is musculoskeletal 10 to 20 percent of the time is gastrointestinal 10% of the time it's stable angina, 5% of the time it's respiratory. So there's a big differential diagnosis. History, rule out the most dangerous, cause first, always. If you always do that, you'll never have medical legal issues in your career. Detailed pain, so do the PQRST thing again. Uh, see where it's located. The acute MIs. These are characteristics of acute heart attacks, a myocardial infarction. So pressure, heaviness, tightness, constriction in the center or left of the chest, worse, uh, worse with exertion, better with rest. Emotional stress or cold sometimes makes it, makes it worse. So radiation to the neck, the jaw, the shoulder, diaphoresis. Uh, people sweating for no reason. Uh, men <laughs> are famous uh, for saying, ah, I ate a piece of pizza or I'm having an acid reflux. And, um, you know, I'm a physician and I, the only, I've been to the ER twice in the last 20 years or something like that. And one of them was uh, severe acid reflux where I, I kind of rolled over to my wife at three in the morning and said, God, my chest is just, killing me all night and like any good doctor I drove myself to the emergency room and it turned out to be acid reflux uh, but uh, you know you got to be careful of these issues so history PQRST so look at the quality pleuritic worse with respiration positional improves uh, improve with sitting up that could be pericarditis sharp or dull is important to note ripping or tearing aortic dissection could uh, could be that Reproducible with palpation, it could be costochondritis. 
uh, location radiation, so uh, point tenderness could be musculoskeletal, diffuse or radiation to the throat, neck, jaw, teeth, that could be a myocardial infarction. Temporal onset, so it could be abrupt, such as a pneumothorax, a dissection, a pulmonary embolism, esophageal rupture, or it could be gradual over minutes, which might be a myocardial, myocardial infarction. So provocation, so what makes it better, what makes it worse? So if it's worse with exertion, that could be angina, it could be esophageal cause. Cold, stress, meals, sex, position, these are all things that will lead you into certain uh, differential diagnoses. Palliation, what makes it better? Rest, angina, sitting up, leaning forward, could be pericarditis. And acids, it could be acid reflux, GI cocktails. Sublingual nitroglycerin, that could be cardiac or esophageal. I've seen several nitroglycerin uh, tablets make esophageal spasm better, so that it, it's not always cardiac. Severity is not predictive of cardiac etiologies. So the history for this, um, cardiac risk factors, um, you can use the calculator, the NCEP or the ATP3 calculator, or you can just do what I do, which is ask the cardiac risk factors, assess them in your head. So family history of cardiac, uh, um, cardiac disease, so first degree relatives is usually what's most important. History of smoking, current history of smoking, substance abuse, so cocaine can lead to heart issues. Diabetes leads to four times the risk for having a myocardial infarction as somebody who does not have diabetes. Hyperlipidemia, so L HDL, low HDL is more indicative of myocardial disease and infarction than LDL, which is what we use to dose statins, of course. So be careful of looking at HDL and as, as well as LDL. Hypertension, blood pressure greater than 140 over 90. Women and the elderly have atypical symptoms, so be careful of that. Age and sex, so be careful of, uh, ha the older you get, everything is worse. That's just one way to think about it. Obesity is another risk factor. So associated symptoms, cardiac could be presyncope or palpitations, pulmonary, exertional dyspnea, cough. GI could be heartburn, regurgitation, dysphagia, belching, bad taste, nausea, vomiting, musculoskeletal, neck, spine, shoulder, so fibromyalgia is in the differential diagnosis. Systemic, fever, fatigue, weight loss, diaphoresis, psychiatric symptoms, panic disorder, depression, anorexia, sleep disturbances. Other medical history, the age, the past medical history, diabetes, hypertension, cancer risk, risk assessment, uh, which we just talked about. So physical exam, vital signs, get an O2 sat to look for hypoxemia, it could be indicative of pulmonary or cardiac etiology. Fever, look for infection or autoimmune. Cardiac, so palpation, feel their point of maximal impulse. Auscultation, both laying and sitting up and leaning, uh, leaning forward. Rhythm, Atrial fibrillation is very easy to feel, uh, and irre irregular, irregular heart rate. You can feel it by just feeling their wrist and the radio pulse usually. Murmurs, gallops, rubs, pulmonary, wheezes, crackles, rawls, ronchi, accessory muscles, retractions, musculoskeletal, palpation, reproducible, um, could be costochondritis. Look at their skin, hyperesthesia or rash, could be shingles, subcutaneous emphysema, Borhave syndrome, which could be a pneumothorax. Abdominal, assess referred pain to the right upper quadrant, for example. Epigastrium, aortic, uh, abdominal or aorta, for example. So differential diagnosis is huge. Myocardial ischemia, non-ischemic, could be aortic dissection, heart failure, pericardi pericarditis, cardiomyopathy, mitral valve disease, pulmonary, could be pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, pneumonia, malignancy, asthma, COPD, Pleuritis, sarcoidosis, or acute chest syndrome, sickle cell anemia, pulmonary hypertension, gastrointestinal, could be esophageal rupture, perforation, Borhave syndrome, gastroesophageal reflux disease, esophageal pain, esophagitis, eosinophilic esophagitis, hiatal hernia, 
esophageal motility disorders, musculoskeletal could be costochondritis, rib pain, rib fractures, could be rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, trauma, psychiatric, panic disorder, depression, somatization, factitious disorders, substance abuse, cocaine and methamphetamine are related to heart disease um, issues and symptoms. Referred pain, shingles, domestic violence, be very careful of domestic violence. And the pl uh, plan or tests for this, so have a low threshold for calling 911, BLS, ACLS, get an EKG, rule out ischemia, be careful on getting one EKG, get serial EKGs, it can change. Get a chest x-ray, get labs, uh, this is usually done in the ER, but get troponins, don't get one troponin, get serial troponins. So other labs, CBC, complete metabolic panel, LFTs, TSH, urinalysis. Uh, get a BNP, brain natriuretic peptide for CHF. Work up in the hospital would include a stress treadmill, myocardial perfusion scan, possibly an echocardiogram. If it's GI, give Prilosec trial or give a GI cocktail. Musculoskeletal, give NSAIDs trial, physical therapy, pulmonary, rule out pulmonary embolism, consider getting a, a D-dimer or a VQ scan. Psychiatric, try SSRI, get a psychiatric consult. So referral, send patient to the ER, and give an aspirin. The first thing I do if I think it's real chest pain uh, associated with the heart is I shove an aspirin in their, in their mouth and say chew it. Morphine helps with symptoms. Put an IV in. So other consults might include pulmonary for a sleep apnea, for example, sleep study, gastroenterology, cardiology. So a summary of what we talked about. We talked about reducing medication errors. We talked about error prone abbreviations. We talked about suicide factors in evaluation. We talked about improving hand patient handoffs. We briefly went over drug overdoses, and we talked about acute evaluation of abdominal and chest pain. And thank you for listening to this important lecture. And as always, feel free to email me or call me with any questions.